anything that particularly resonated for you? Any uh, scenes or moments or um, uh, anything, uh, any lines, something that someone said? Um, was there anything that really stood out for you? Or um, There's no right or wrong answers. There's, it's not a test. Yes? I am. Um
Well, and even maybe even like as situations um, change in people's personal lives, you know, like the fact that Angie was willing to go against her husband and go, you know, right, you know, bring some folks in to, to try to get the woman who could save this baby, yes. you know, and just how that's, that really is how it is in life, how we just sort of, you know, we may see something one way, and when our situation changes, we might see it from another way. Right, the moment to moment, our, our perspective, our can, perspective change can, on. can change depending upon our circumstances, mm -hmm. or our needs, or, or, or what learning we Uh, Michael, you, uh, you mentioned politicians, and uh, they're the ones that set the policies. Um, I agree with that, but people's lives that get impacted by immigration and things like that, it's not by politicians, it's by the people on the ground. Very true, but policy is what changes how people have to react to that. Right. Um, Lord knows, I, I have lived near the border myself, and, and yes, there is this flow and there are so many issues involved with people crossing borders illegally. Um, and yes, it's been going on for hundreds of years since there was a border there. But changes in governmental policy change how people on the ground have to react to it. Right. Um, yeah, Coop says they keep, we can't work them anymore, but they keep coming. Yeah. They used to work them, illegal or not, right. but they can't anymore. And yet they still come, but they can't do anything when they come. Yeah, and, and I think that because here in the society we're taught to look for a quick fix a lot of the time, uh, that people who make policy, people who make media, would like us to see things as simply one side or the other. And there isn't. There's all these different layers. Every single character in this play has a different take on what's going on on the ground. Yes. I think in many ways the play is about power. It's about power and privilege, and it's about community. But as a person of color looking at this play, it's about who has power and privilege and who doesn't. And I think it's very powerful the scene between Angela and her husband. And no, it was Angela and. I'm sorry, I got your character. Who? No, big lady. Oh, um, two of you is, and he was seen as stupid and slow and not creative and all that. Not understanding that when you don't have options, you don't have the ability to be creative and want more for your life. I, I think it really frustrates me that so often that people with privilege just simply do not understand what it is like to have no options. I think the other thing is to show that how that privilege and pow power in particular play out even within a marriage. That marriage is disintegrated. So it isn't just this big force out there. It's to show how it works everything, even the most personal aspects of our life. And it was really heartbreaking for me to see that marriage devolving so rapidly and seeing these people who once loved each other so much um, they can't even communicate anymore. They can't even they they can't even listen anymore. They don't even see each other anymore. So that was very powerful powerful for me. I think the other thing is to look at the impact of immigration around the world. I've seen it around the world. What happens when people are colonized? Not just and we are a colonizer in North America. We don't like to think of even people of color. When we get scattered around the world, we are enacting as colonizers. I've been to Europe, I've been to Africa, and I've seen the impact of colonization. And why do you have people traveling from Africa or from Mexico? Because there's not enough social, there's not enough social and economic foundation to support their people. I don't think, I've been to Mexico. Mexicans are not dying to get out of their country because they don't love it anymore, or they don't like the culture, they don't, they have to go, they have to go to enable the people who remain behind to survive. So to me, it ultimately is, it's, it's how power works, who it works for, 
who it harms. And I think it's very powerful to see the death in this, because even though in, in, in many people's realities, nobody gets shot and dies, the reality is there's a lot of death as a direct result. And it's not even policies, because policies are put in place to protect or to harm. It's this underlying uh, ocean of, of uh, no justice that these cultures are resting on right now. In many ways, all cultures are suddenly resting on this no justice. And, and you know, you can point at it and say, well, this is just Malthus in action. But where do you draw those lines? I mean, this is the question we're all facing here as characters. Where's that line? Um, you know, for Angie, it's, I'm going to betray my husband's ideals. You know, for Coop, it's like, I'm going to just alienate everybody I know. Where do we draw those lines? Because of those pressures. <laughs> well, sorry, Coop, true. but... What was your name again? Yeah. <laughs> but, but it is true, because you have to figure out where's her personal line. And, and yeah, if you don't have any choices, if you don't have any options, Suddenly, those lines are a lot clearer. Sucks. I don't think Coop wants to alienate people. Yeah, I don't think so either. No, Coop is just a product of his own. Yeah. You know, I don't think he is. He likes, to, he likes yeah. to treat his fellow growers fairly if they're in a jam. You know, I can buy your shaker and help you out. Well, You're I think his shaker. idea of fair isn't necessarily what everyone else's idea of fair is. I mean, I think it does. Some of it gets back to what Georgiana was saying about that idea of power and privilege. Who really? does come from a certain place of, of privilege, so he has options. But I don't think he's always pressing his advantage to the negative. I mean, I, I thought you overstated a little, Michael, to say that he sure. doesn't care about it. Because, you know, otherwise he wouldn't give Nessie a break on the rent. Yeah, I don't think Very he's true. a delicious dude at all. In fact, I think that he just knows what he knows, and we know what we know, and there's a divide. He is standing on the platform of privilege. I wouldn't and, attribute and, him and malice no, at all. Right, yeah. right, right, exactly. There's no malice, but he's standing high above. Privilege, yeah. 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 Yes? I think to kind of build off all of these comments, I found the analogy for the, the subtext of the cockfighting really pertinent. I mean, because I, I feel like it's not, I mean, we're all those, those different roosters, we're all different fighting, and it, we're, we're caught up in that system. And so I think it's that question of the underlying power and privilege and domination that's affecting this whole system. So it's like each one of us is our, we're in that system. And I think Coop's also in that system. He's one of those things. And it's not, I don't know, I just feel like he's, he's in that same thing. And it's not really, he's doing his thing. Like you said, you know, it's not, he's just pushing it. And so I, I found that really powerful to uh, extend that analogy. say about cockfighting. Just a couple of scared creatures and they're trying to survive. Exactly. Oof. This unseen hand throws us all into this nice. situation. Nice. And we're all just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. End up tearing each other apart. Mm -hmm. um, I found it interesting. Uh, I think it, it, Angie's character fascinates me. <laughs> she fascinates me because uh, and it's only been a year, right, since since uh, it's been Carl's. almost a year since yeah, he's since he's dead. Dead. and it must. I mean, I, 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 I th this play is so great because it really opens up for me. Like, what happened before? It's like there's not not every play makes me wonder exactly what preceded it and exactly what's going to happen after it. But I feel like this is just like a chunk taken out. But the story is much longer than we see, and that's really cool. And, uh, but I wonder what the conversation was a year prior right. when he was in Because there must have been a conversation. They obviously are equals in this relationship right. um, uh, with the, their different power dynamic. Uh, so there must have been a conversation. It must have been positive. You took the job a year later. I, I don't know. Like, did Angie not realize that the, the community, like, then the community reaction to it? But she's pretty happy about the house and two cars. Right. And she even holds that up as a, as a badge. It's so interesting. I just her character's so interesting to me. Um, I just I also feel like I mean for even I, I don't know if she agreed with it. Yes, she enjoys the money, but when I think mm -hmm. about it, I feel like he he still 
does, I mean, he does what he wants to do, and they put that yeah, job sure. and answer, yeah. and they're like, and she does what she wants to do. Um, but I, I do think it's interesting, if it's been in that year, I think that the I, whole idea of him cheating on her, well, I think she has, he's already betrayed her, he's already cheated on her and her family, you know, and that's all of that has built up in this, this year. I think it's one of the most audacious pieces of the writing in this play, is to have him be immigration in a small town in southern New Mexico. And you know how common that is. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like but, oh my God, the, 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 the community would literally have risen up screaming. How dare you? You sold us out. Not everybody, though. No, but, but so much of the tradition there is to, to see La Migra as the enemy. And the very idea of, of Carlos, now Carl, I love that bit. No one calls him Carlos anymore. Being a, an immigration officer, oh, that's just stunning. It's like, the first time I read it, I thought, oh, you son of a bitch. You know, and I was born in this country, but I still thought, right. you son of a bitch. Right. But then, to see why he's doing it, and that's because he's trying to catch the big guy. Exactly. Who's, you know, hurting all these immigrants. Yeah. And, and he's trying yes, to make an opportunity better. by bringing them over, but taking advantage of them, and right. maybe in, right. the, in right. the desert, right. the, right. And it's better than Walmart. Yeah. Oof. Well, it's, um, you know, kind of a, I don't know if it's a microcosm or a macrocosm, uh, I guess a microcosm in the sense of that, that one of the themes that I see is playing really strongly for it. It's that um, each of the characters is seeking connection, is seeking some sense of connection um, as well. I mean, where Coop has lost his wife, and so he's still connected to the community in general, and he has some slightly more personal relationships, but uh, you know he's he's sort of more on the outskirts of that. But he, definitely, the other five characters each are looking for some sense of connection and belonging, whether within a family, within a marriage, within a community. Um, that that all of that. So the way that that leaves through um, a, as well. Um, you know, sort of beneath the umbrella of the larger issues, um, but that it, again, like the really uh, human part of the of the story that each of these people are are looking for, or you know, are having some sort of difficulty um, connecting, finding that so, you know, where yeah, Nezi has has family, but she's missing her husband. And she's talking about yeah, when it used to be more than. Uh, a guy and his wife and their kids, the family was this big extended. And the doors were always open, and now the doors are, some doors are shut. And yeah. 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 Well, and it makes me think about that notion of family, of how, you know, Carl really feels like Nessie is family, but then, right, you yeah. say, oh, no, she's not your family, she's my family. And makes that distinction, and then there's the whole idea of um, of the will and the will not passing on the back acreage, you know, and there that's family too, and or what you know you thought was your family, this partnership that you'd had for thirty, 30 years, years, exactly, and you know you two were like peas in the pod there, mm -hmm. you know. You go all day without speaking, or all week without hardly speaking to each other, but you were there right next to each other every night looking out the land, you know. What's, what's, where's that definition of family too? Right, so the way that each of these things has also been isolated and set apart from, because whether it's because Coop has the privilege and so he's seen as the enemy or as working for immigration being part, part of Nika, that that even within his own marriage is, is causing a schism, and, Brazil having been gone for nearly 20 years, and so she's not really part initially, and, and this everyone's sort of suspicious of her. And, oh, you're just going to come back and sell the farm, and yeah, and she leaves all. I mean, there's again, it's like these isolated in their own little pods, kind of been wanting to break out and be part of that, but there are all these different factors that do keep them separated, um, despite wanting that. significant that Chewie takes money for transport, whereas uh, Zelda's father didn't, as, uh, as, as the script alludes to. I don't know what to do with that, I just think it's significant. Yeah, I think it's significant. 
detail. Mm -hmm. uh, quite hard to do it. There's definitely privilege involved, but I, I, it also is a, a, another definition of family, of, you know, like your, your racial family. Yes. 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 Well, in terms of, you know, forgive us, an actor talk, you create all this backstory for your character, whether you mean to do it or not, or whether you sit down and do it or not. You create all this stuff that happens for your character, and certainly the gambling was a big part of it in terms of he loses money frequently, mm -hmm. but also a sense of wanting privilege. I have been working this land for 32 years, and what am I getting other than a paycheck? This extra money, this extra thing makes me feel like I have a little privilege, like I have a little power. And that was a big part of my thinking when I was but I also wonder, uh, I mean, in terms of he's, uh, compared to the other coyotes who take money and then leave people to die, that, you know, so is it is it a betrayal or not a betrayal? Or not a betrayal. It's, I know, well, it's then, an then opportunity. He sees Carl as betraying by working for me, but, and he's taking care of people. So, yes, he does still take the money. But at the same um, time, he's offering them the so same chance he had. He even says so. I come a long way since Zacatecas, which is in northern Mexico. So, you know, right. yeah, I'm helping people. Yes, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, that Carl's right. character is yeah. not helping people. He sees himself as helping. But to, to, to Chewy, no, he's, he's stopping people from improving their lives. I have real empathy for Carl. He, because again, I, you know, as a person of color looking at this, uh, it's like we're going to give you a little toehold, and it's really tenuous, by the way, into the so-called middle class. But this is what you got to do to do it. Mm -hmm. And granted, other people of color who ascended into the middle class may not have had their choices created so starkly, like you're, you're, you're an immigration officer for God's sake. But if you look at other other groups of people who've had, you know, large numbers of people disenfranchised in a tiny little, you know, bourgeoisie, I guess you'd call them, uh, they have to give up a lot too. They have to give up a lot to get those two cars. And they may not be actively doing something the way that Carl was, but they're not also sometimes doing, you know, anything to advance the cause of the people who are left behind. So there's a sense within a lot of communities of betrayal that when you get into the system, you basically have to sell your soul to not only just get in there, but what's worth staying in there. And there have been a lot of studies I know on African American middle and upper middle class people, and the thing that's been interesting is the level of anger there because it's kind of like you don't get to be your authentic self in this bigger culture. You've got to kind of sustain by meeting their expectations. And a lot of times those are not reflective of who, you know, I am. I'm just going to personalize it. Who I am as, a, as an African-American woman. So I really do have empathy for that character because if you're like the handmaid, <coughs> like the police getting mad at the police. The police are just the handmaidens of, of, of the people who really have power. They don't have power. They're doing, the, they're doing due diligence to protect the interests of the people who have real power. And so it puts the folks into this very uncomfortable uh, position. And so I do. I, I have a lot of empathy. I thought his wife was like, whoa, yeah, she... <laughs>
But I think they're very reflective of what happens in the sense that power warps with relationships communally and personally. Well, yeah, and I think also, you know, to kind of add on to what you were saying, the, the idea of um, who calls the shots versus who executes the orders. And, and so that being in a place where, yeah, if you're not the one who establishes the policies, but you have to enforce them, that, yeah, you still don't have power. But other people will sometimes interpret that, you know, or, or their perception is, yeah, well, you could do something or not. It's like, hey, this is my job. I'm, I'm doing my job, and I do my work, and then I go home. Um, you know, we're, and I think where Angie's kind of saying, but you do have more of a choice, that that's part of it also. It's like he, he, he doesn't have the power to change that more because he is more the foot soldier than the, the general, really, determining the strategy. So, again, it comes down to a question of power in that sense as well. Um, I think it's interesting. That, so uh, my dad and I uh, disagree quite a lot politically, and mm -hmm. uh, but but we we have enjoyable conversations. My mom and I agree, but we don't have enjoyable conversations. My dad and I don't agree, but we can have enjoyable discussions. And I think that that's the but but that my point is that uh, my dad and I have basically the same values, and we look at these values. And we're like, yeah, we agree on these values. We acknowledge that we agree on these values, and yet how he sees the logical way for him to act on those values is completely different than I see what is the logical way to act on those values. And I find that maddening and also fascinating. And I, and I feel like that's reflected in this play that I feel like everybody in the play knows what world they're in and are looking at the same world and see the same problems with that world, and yet every single one of them chooses how to react to that differently. But I don't think that they're not on the same page. I really do think they're on the same page, but they just don't, they see different solutions. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's anyone blind to what the sitch is. I was kind of curious, like what would have happened if Carl was the one who actually caught Angie Thinking he was catching chewing, you know how would Ooh, that's that, uncomfortable thought. You know how yeah. would that have been played out? <clears throat> like, I mean, he was shocked when, you know, here's Chewy, and wait a minute, that's my wife's name. You know, mm -hmm. um, just the, the torment that probably would have, you know, the conflict inside of, of that sort of thing. It, you know, and that's even. I think that that's where, when we're in different situations, we sort of flex, or, or the circumstances around us might flex some of our Or might not, thoughts. depending on what kind of person yeah. you are, right? And that's yeah, what I find interesting, sort of too. Flex the way we look at something or not look at something based on what's around us and the influences and the feedback that we're getting from situations and people around us and stuff like that. And some people aren't as fluid and just see one path. And it doesn't matter how many hearts break on that path. That's just the path. Right. There are a lot of people that are like that. And then there are other people that are just like, no, you could just cut off in the woods right here. Mm -hmm. and then, I mean, you know, this is so to people of different degrees of flexibility and, and rule following. You know, I just, some people are rule followers, some people are rule breakers. Some well, usually, you know, most people fall in somewhere in the middle. And well, that rule, but not that one. And so, and, and I'm not sure that morality, of course, comes into it, uh, ethics and morality come to it a, a certain way, but there's also just your nature. And, and I think, I, I, I think that's true, right? I think that there's a basic nature that's, that's hard to change, the core of you that's hard to change. Other things? Other, other comments? I think we're need to draw to a close. Um, but just I don't want to cut anyone off if there's anything else that you want to share that was particularly um, meaningful for you or uh, a perspective that you have. I have a perspective to share. And that is that I think what um, 
coming, and please do fill out your suitcase, drop your box before you go, and hope to see you May 19th or 20th.